Hi, good morning again, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our fourth session on understanding the Azure Data State and Solution Patterns with Chris Zafarlis, who is another PW alumni. So I think that's a recurring theme this morning. Um, so we are gonna go ahead and get started. Chris, if you're ready, start whenever you want. Yeah, thanks, Liz. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, yeah, so my name is Chris Zafarlis. I'm a senior cloud solution architect over here at Microsoft. Um, I was at PW for a little short of two years, and. A uh, great place to be and, and really excited to be, um, you know, hosting this session this week. Um, certainly, if there are any questions, if we go long or anything like that, um, I'll have my email at the end. That you guys can follow up and, and I'll try to answer questions to the group, too. And uh, we'll figure out a way to make these slides available because they have some great resources available, too. So we are going to talk about um, the Azure Data Platform uh, sort of at a higher level. We're not going to get too granular. Um, and then, you know, essentially kind of look at some design patterns and migrations and, and, you know, some benefits and some total cost of ownership and things like that. So um, starting off, really, it's, it, it starts with this theme that the world is changing, right? And our requirements are changing and we're moving at the speed of light, right? And, uh, and digital transformation has been um, somewhat of a buzzword over the years. But the reality is, um, you know, recently came th across a stat that, 52% uh, of the Fortune 500 from the year 2000 uh, is no longer in business. And, uh, you know, so when you think about that over a 19 year period, short of 20 years, we've lost more than uh, half of the Fortune 500. And, and really, uh, a lot of that has to be attributed for uh, that failure to um, digitally transform and, and embrace uh, technology and, and move the businesses forward. And, and with those changes uh, come, you know, significant changes to what our data is doing, right? Volume of data is just astronomical. Um, the speed at which it's coming to us and the different types are crazy. And so what it does, is it leads us to this question is, what do we do with all this data and, and, and how do we derive value from it? And, and really, um, we can figure that out by answering these questions is, you know, what has happened in the past? Uh, what is happening now and, and what's going to happen in the future? Now, granted, you know, there's no crystal ball, right? Um, but with, with the onslaught of AI and, and machine learning and the capabilities of, of sort of learning from our past, uh, if we can even be, you know, 1% uh, more effective or more accurate in our projections and, and, and our expectations, uh, it means that we're, we're that much more accurate than we were. So really, as, as we kind of roll and we look at where this is going is that, you know, 80% of all businesses are, are adopting that cloud first strategy. And so they're taking advantage of the fact that you have this massive scalability and elasticity and capability and, and this platform that allows you to uh, expand on what you have uh, without having to refactor necessarily or, uh, you know, reinvent the wheel. But take it in bite-sized chunks, you know, take it one application at a time, or, or if there's a new need that, that, that comes up, taking that, um, that application on and, and going from there, right? Uh, from, you know, obviously we're, we talked about how much data is growing, you know, we're, we're looking at uh, somewhere around 44 zettabytes just next year, and, and AI investment uh, that's taking advantage of all that data and, and, and looking at what we can learn from the past and, and how it will help us make choices for the future uh, is just growing astronomically as well. Uh, but the three of those being harnessed at the same time is really what allows companies to outperform. And, you know, when we look at a company like eSmart Systems, right, uh, they are able to save uh, just tons of money by deploying a connected drone uh, that is out and inspecting, um, you know, lines in the middle of nowhere that would be uh, otherwise have to be done manually. Uh, these drones are, are employing uh, AI and ML to be able to compare what a, a healthy uh, line would be versus, you know, what, what, where there could be some damage and things like that. Hey, Chris. Yeah. Is there something in the background where you are like a hot, it almost sounds like a tea kettle is what people are saying and I can hear it too. No, no, I just wonder if it's my headset. Um, let me see, is that any better? Is it only when I talk or? Uh, I don't think I hear it now. Does anybody else hear it now? Maybe it. Okay, it might, might be a headset then. I, I can just go on speaker if I need to. Um, uh, yeah, it's back. Yeah, so I can yeah. definitely hear it. <laughs> okay, let's see if this is any better then.
Chris, if you hover over the um, little connection icon, you should be able to, yeah, yeah, there you go. You should be able to change your settings in that little gear, I think. Yep, Chris is working on his sound right now. We had a little background noise, so we're trying to fix that, guys. And we don't have a session right after this for the lunch break, so it's okay if we go a little bit over. Chris, let me know if you're talking because I don't hear anything. <laughs> He's trying, guys. <laughs> it does not like showing the Crowdcast screen. So sorry, guys. We're going to work on this and, and get it reconnected here in just a second. Poor Chris, he was having a, a good session. Thank you guys for the feedback. We appreciate it. And we're definitely getting Chris back on. There he is. Yes. Can you hear me? We can. Oh, okay, cool. All right, let's go back to that then. <laughs> I'm not sure what was going on. Yeah, is the high pitch still there? No, I don't hear it. Let me know if anybody else does. Um, Okay. But I think it sounds good. So if you, sorry that we had to interrupt because you had a good flow going. Yeah, it's all good. Um, let's kill this. So you guys don't have to look at my mug. Um, okay. Should we back into it? Yes, we are okay. back into it. Thank you guys. Yep. Apologies. Nope. Uh, you're good. It, let's get through. Okay. So yeah, so eStart, eSmart systems, um, just you know what they're using is is images of uh, previ exi previously existing, um, you know, well performing uh, towers versus you know damage and, and things like that. When they can do some comparisons using AI and ML, uh, sending these images up into Azure, processing that data, and essentially triggering alerts saying, hey, this this uh, this pole or this line needs repair. Um, and it really, it, it just can't be done without the modern data state, you know, and so um, with that, you know, we start to look at what some of those main components are, you know, whether it be uh, mobile devices or, or online shopping or, or chat platforms or, you know, security and, and different streaming. Um, essentially all of that data has to land somewhere you know so whether it, it be uh, an operational database or a data warehouse uh, or you know a data lake you know everybody wants to know you know what kind of data lake do for me and those kinds of questions come up all the time right and so uh, the question becomes more about how do we get from our on-prem environment to the cloud and and you know what steps need to be taken from um, you know, using our existing systems uh, on-prem and expanding them to the cloud, or uh, lift and ship off, shift operations, or again, you know, just taking on what those new um, new workloads might be, uh, it, it, having that cloud-first strategy. 
And so what, what Azure provides is that one seamless area where uh, you've, you've got this capability to extend your on-premises, you know, whether they be data centers or, or um, you know, your cabinets in, in the back office, you know, right up in through using a hybrid story up into Azure, you know, so, um, and, and there are different strategies on how to attack this. And so, um, you know, essentially, once you have that in place, it gives you a great foundation for your business intelligence and, and your AI, uh, you know, to be able to uh, improve that, that, you know, operational reporting or, or uh, you know, projections for the sales team in, in, in manufacturing and those kinds of things, right? And so um, we'll kind of go through where we go with this, right? And so when you look at the um, Azure data platform, plus the AI platform and the BI platform, and really we're gonna focus on on the, the data piece of it today, um, you know, but we have this massive landscape to work with. And, and you know, this is all part of the, the data platform in Azure. And, um, you know, we aren't even including the open source things, plus uh, for some of the first party partnerships that we have, um, you know, but when we start looking at um, what the, the key components are here, you've got your ingestion components, you know, and, um, so you can pull the data into Azure Data Factory or, or you know, using an SDK to uh, open up a port to, you know, some kind of a storage or something like that. You get your import services um, and you've got your, your traditional database systems, you know, um, and there's nothing traditional about Azure, uh, Cosmos DB, but uh, you know, when we, when we look at what the offerings are, a lot of flexibility around there. We've got our SQL data warehouse for our, our massive OLAP workloads, right? And using that massively parallel processing system as a baseline for, um, you know, staging any data or, or doing that processing. And then what, what are we going to do with the data after it's been processed? Are we going to present it? Are we going to store it? Uh, you know, or, or are we going to land it to begin with? Do we need to land it in a database or a data lake? You know, and, and a lot of capability and options there. Uh, and then when we start to do some transformation or, or want to um, do any processing of the data, we've got a lot of choices about what we want to use there. HD Insight, Databricks, uh, you're hearing about a lot, right? And, and a lot of the capability it has. And then um, if we have streaming workloads, right, how, how are we processing that? How are we pulling the data in uh, from IoT devices or uh, from our connected cars or, or social media for sentiment analysis and, and all these factors that we have to consider? Uh, and then what are we doing with that data when it gets to Azure? You know, are we processing it with stream analytics and then uh, spitting it out to a dashboard or, or, or are we taking it using HD Insight or, or Databricks and, and a Spark engine using Spark Streaming uh, to, to then pass that over to a Power BI or, or do some other kind of uh, analytics on it, right? And then um, obviously we've got our front end, you know, using, using Power BI and Azure Analysis Services for staging the data and presenting the data, um, you know, so you can use those in conjunction or you can use Azure Analysis Services for uh, you know, uh, the semantic layer and using Power BI for your presentation layer. A um, lot of capability around machine learning, a uh, lot of platforms there, right? So uh, Databricks, you can see, shows up in multiple places because of its flexibility. Um, but really, it comes down to, you know, what, what, are, you, what are you strongest in? Do you, are you looking for a low-code, no-code solution? Or are you looking for uh, a true coding environment with, uh, with some great collaboration options with something like Azure Databricks? Uh, then we get into really the, the heart of our AI, AI offerings using cognitive services and our bot service um, to be able to start getting into, you know, vision and speech and language APIs um, that, are, that are giving you uh, more flexibility to work with your data and, and expand upon it and, and work directly with customers in a, in a um, uh, non-conventional way and, and being able to respond to them quickly and easily and, uh, again, uh, work with work with those teams to help um, you know whether it be triage their their challenges that they're having or for customer service issues uh, you know anything like that we, you know we've got some great platforms to be able to uh, minimize the upfront human capital um, that that's required to be responsive but also be able to do it effectively and, and accurately you know because um, you, you've all seen commercials on TV where somebody's screaming into the phone because uh, the, 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 the voice is not going through properly and they're not understanding what you're trying to say. You know, 
we want to, we want to try to eliminate those frustrations for our customers. And so um, taking it one step further, looking at things like Azure search uh, for um, doing deeper uh, indexing of, of data that comes out and then coupling that with something like cognitive services to put some intelligence on top of that deep search. And then there's just Azure Data Catalog, which you know really offers a, a great solution for understanding what reports we have, what data sources we have, who created the reports, uh, where are the reports that we need, and, and how do we uh, get them to the users that need them. And, and that all is backed with um, a, a great set of tools from, from both the development environment uh, to the architecture and the infrastructure and the security elements that are all uh, critical in making sure that all these data solutions flow together nicely. And this is all um, included in, in our 54 worldwide regions. And so, uh, you know, as you can see right there, right, more than uh, twice what AWS and Google have combined. Uh, and, and we're, you know, on, on six of the seven continents, um, still waiting for that, for that Antarctica data center. It's going to be fun when that one comes up. Uh, but, you know, you can see that we're, we're um, very densely populated where our user base is. And so uh, we're giving a lot of flexibility and capability to our customers and all around the world. And when we break it down and look at that Azure data platform specifically, I want to look at four key areas today that are going to help us kind of move to that next conversation. You know, how, how, where do we go from here? Right? And so we look, we're going to first look at the modernization on premises, right? And so a lot of a lot of great capability has come out in the last few years with SQL Server. Uh, 2017 introduced Linux uh, and Docker containers. Um, you know, and now we've got Windows Server, so you can actually run it in any of the three platforms that you prefer. Uh, and then also uh, with 2019, we are actually integrating our uh, big data uh, clusters and for non-structured data, unstructured data, um, right alongside with our structured data, um, you know, separate, separate systems that can all work together. Um, you know, so being able to query from our, our RDVMS systems over to an unstructured data source using Polybase, um, all living on the same server is um, is a great opportunity to have that unified access. Um, and then having all that data in one place and then being able to run intelligent analysis on all three of those with things like ML and R server uh, built into SQL. And really, um, what we want to do is look at the bottom of this, where we're going from our own on-premises workloads, um, you know, our quote-unquote private cloud, right up into the public cloud, and, and sort of how do we traverse those waters, right? Um, we, we all know that SQL Server has um, industry-leading performance and security, um, and it's the only um, uh, enterprise-level database with AI built in, right? And so those insights that help us to understand what's happening in our systems, you know, whether it be intelligent query planning or uh, tuning or, or indexes being created, those kinds of things. Uh, <clears throat> but as we as we start to look at how do we move some of those workloads from uh, from our on-premises environment to the cloud or even other cloud systems, you know, there are certain things that, that we have to evaluate as we go through that, right? And so uh, we, we've got some great tools built in with the Azure Database Migration Service, and I've got some, some good links afterward that you guys can check out some of these services so we don't go too deep on them today. Um, but whether they be, you know, a, an open source MySQL or or Oracle database on-prem that you want to migrate up into SQL Server, uh, they're going to give you some some great, um, uh, call it a run book, if you will, or, or you know, a, a whole plan on, on m making that migration uh, simpler, right? Migrations are always hard. Uh, nobody's going to tell you otherwise, but it's going to uh, somewhat help you to make that migration a little uh, smoother, if you will. And really, um, the idea is that we want to help with your ROI story and lessen the total cost of ownership that it's going to take to do those migrations. Uh, we want to give the flexibility to be able to migrate from multiple platforms um, and then even take some of those uh, NoSQL or, or unstructured data sources uh, that you're using on-prem and, and move them up into something like Cosmos DB. 
And the SQL database has uh, obviously some some great opportunity here. It's, it's seamless and compatible with your on-premises SQL servers, and uh, you know being able to push data up to them is is very straightforward. Uh, you can save a significant amount of money with hybrid use benefits and and uh, reserve capacity if if you've already bought some licensing and you want to prepay for the compute that you're going to use. Um, you know, introducing something like hyperscale where you can you, uh, use up to 100 terabytes worth of database space um, on a single database uh, is, is just uh, otherworldly at this point. Um, the industry leading security, things around, um, you know, data classification and, and obfuscation, um, security from end to end, whether, you know, it would be uh, data at rest, data on the wire, uh, TDE, uh, always, always on HA, uh, those types of things. And then obviously the built in intelligence for the, for the tuning and <clears throat> performance uh, changing. So now when we look at um, what the migration service can do for us at, at a very high level um, is that it's going to, as I mentioned earlier, break down and give you um, somewhat of a guide on, you know, uh, if, if you're moving from a, a Mongo or an Oracle or, a, a, you know, we even have things like Cassandra and uh, Access listed in there. It's going to give you that run book. Um, <clears throat> and depending on the system, some, some migrations are easier than others. Again, none being easy. Uh, but then we've also got um, native uh, VNet support for something like managed instance, where you need an isolated environment. Um, it's isolated. It's isolated from other Azure customers. It's isolated from everybody else, and it's it has uh, no public access to the internet. Uh, so you're you're really uh, locking that that server down and allowing for an easier uh, migration because it has more capabilities than SQL DB uh, that we're lacking for a while. And so when we look at the full slate of what's available in, in Azure SQL Database, a uh, significant amount of options, right? Um, a couple different um, <clears throat> ways to deploy a single database. You've got elastic pools, which means that you can uh, use the same database server with multiple databases over it and um, have a shared amount of space across those databases for when data can ebb and flow, how much you need, and, and you know for peak times and things like that. And then you've got managed instance, which really helps that um, you know, modernization aspect where you want to take an application that's on prem and you want to move it to the cloud uh, and you want to be able, you want to minimize the refactoring that you have to do on that application. So we say, you know, low friction and effort uh, to, to do that migration. And now some new, newly announced uh, services like the single Azure database um, serverless option, right, where you, where you don't have to set up a SQL server anymore, and, and now you can uh, pause those databases. You've also got hyperscale. As I mentioned earlier, you can go up to 100 terabytes. You've got your general general purpose and your business critical. And, and depending on the service, these are all aligned based around, you know, what um, what your SLAs are and what you need for redundancy and backup and um, high availability. So there's decisions to be made around that as, you know, whether you want general purpose or business critical. And that also plays into the licensing aspects and which licenses you already own and which ones you can use to apply to those different tiers. So the managed instance, uh, this came out about a year ago, and and uh, and that was for general purpose, and then I think uh, about nine months ago for for business critical, um, and this is this is you know a ninety nine percent SQL Server. Uh, the only major uh, pieces that are missing right now are things like file stream and file store, uh, MSDTC. Uh, other than that, you know, we're able to bring in the .NET code and CLR and, and you know, a lot of the features that people uh, weren't getting from their Azure, Azure SQL DBs. Um, and, we're, and we're really tr offering this, this true managed instance of a SQL server in the platform as a service arena where you don't have to worry about managing the underlying hardware, patching the OS, um, Running um, patches on on any of the hardware, any of uh, any of the drivers, any of that stuff, right? That all goes away, uh, and and we're also patching your SQL Server for you. Uh, you can defer them, uh, you know, and, and some great features around backups, and you can do point in time backups through command line, uh, you know, and so you've got a lot of capability here uh, for both, you know, um, uh, migrations and new workloads. 
So when it comes to, um, you know, why uh, SQL is a great cost, cost effective solution is because we know that a lot of our customers already have SQL. And so they can leverage some of the licenses they already have by using what we call Azure hybrid use benefit. Uh, and this is going to, you know, drastically reduce the amount that you're paying for that monthly platform as a service offering. And um, you can pay for reserved capacity and, and you know, set up a, a total cost of ownership very easily by using the Azure calculator. Uh, and then also dev and test pricing um, saves you about 30% typically um, on what the, the full cost of the service would be. And, you know, that's similar to what you would use for dev test on prem, right? So you're not going to pay for the SQL licenses for um, your, your development environment on prem and, you know, just for production, right? And so we're going to give you reduced... Um, uh, cost when, when we go to dev test pricing on an enterprise agreement. And SQL Server has by far and away the, the best total cost of ownership on any cloud, right? So it's our product. We're going to stand behind it and we're going to get it, we're going to get it to you for less. Um, you know, you can see savings up to 59% uh, versus AWS for the licensing costs. And then moving on from, from the, the more traditional SQL Server, looking at what we have for open source options, right? And, and you know, why a, a platform as a service option, option is better than, say, uh, running this on a, a virtual machine on-prem or, or in Azure, you know, and, and a lot of it comes down to uh, what it takes to run those backend systems, right? Let's, let's step back from uh, maintaining underlying servers and, and worrying about the security threats of, of those servers and, you know, uh, where patches are required and things like that. Um, and let's, let's, uh, let's concentrate on, on the data that we're working with here, right? So uh, these systems are going to be op optimized for performance. We're going to uh, eliminate uh, the complexities behind uh, building HA, you know, MySQL or, or Postgres uh, deployments. Uh, you know, we've got our, our security uh, built in as well, you know, for, for things like data classification and, and, you know, those types of elements that, that you're not going to get elsewhere. Um, and, and really, it can be challenging and costly to, um, you know, spin up a new server and, and the amount of time it takes. And especially if you're not going to use it all the time, you know, you're, you're, you only use it during peak times or uh, you don't you don't require all of that. And so you instead of having to pay a, an upfront capital cost, uh, now you can reduce that, have an operational cost and only grab the hardware when you need it. And so when we look at what what the options are you know and and this is just for starters as platform as service options uh you know you you've got a great um uh, replacement if you will for your mysql your postgres and your maria db um, uh, deployments right and so you've got a migration using the database migration service uh, and then being able to um, maintain the, the same versions that you currently currently use most likely uh, but then you've got the the components that are available only in the platform as a service offering that you would have to maintain and manage yourself you know things like the uh, elastic scaling and high availability and security and compliance um, and then you know the global availability and, and sort of the integration with the rest of the azure platform so um, here's here's some of the the newer versions that are supported, um, you know, of, of the various offerings, you know, and, and these are being patched automatically for you. You you don't have to worry about patching them yourself uh, because these systems are platform as a service offerings. So you just have to worry about accessing your data and putting your data in it uh, and, and making sure that your passwords are up to date and they're not being left wide open, right? So um, just el eliminating a lot of the back end work that's required. Um, and then having the ability, uh, the ability to quickly scale up, you know, uh, we just hit a threshold, our, our app just went um, uh, viral and, and now, you know, we need to throw a bunch of hardware at this very quickly. Uh, we've got, you know, a very, very simple slider bar, right? In a lot of cases, you can just um, add up, you know, in, in, uh, can uh, add the compute that you need in order to uh, satisfy the challenges that you're having and the bottlenecks that you're hitting. So a lot, of, a lot of good capability there around being able to add that, and you don't have to go and build that on-prem, right? 
Um, we have 91 security and compliance certificates now. Uh, that's more than double of any of our competitors. Uh, a lot of capability around some of the real common ones like like Sarbox and SOC and ISO and PCI and HIPAA and you know all, all the all the major ones are um, obviously covered here. Um, but then also the the built-in encryption for data um, in motion and in rest at rest right um, some services will allow you to turn off the encryption if you'd like to um, it's not all will some will it's not recommended obviously uh, but we you know we do know that encryption adds a little bit of overhead and, uh, depending on your operations maybe you're comfortable with turning it off but that then that capability is frequently there um, but then we've also got things like the Azure Active Directory integration uh, so that you can use your your already existing um, authentication systems that you're using on-prem because we know that 90% of businesses are using Active Directory in some form or another. Uh, and so if we can synchronize that with our on-premises Active Directory using Azure Active Directory, uh, we can use that same single sign-on experience from uh, our on-premises environment right up into the cloud. And we talked about how far we can go. Currently, 38 of the 54 Azure regions uh, can handle the um, uh, the open source database options where, you know, we'll be building those more up over time, uh, but currently 38 of the 54, so about two thirds. And um, more importantly is, is the integration with the Azure ecosystem. You know, you, you can you can see that there are um, there are icons there for a data factory and streaming um, uh, stream analytics and um, you know, virtual machines, whether they be, uh, you know, those types of things and ML and, and a lot of the major services that we're using in other areas uh, that are helping us to expand upon the data and, and create information and knowledge from that data are widely available. And, and that integration story is, is hugely important when you start to compare what it takes to have that integrated to your on-premises sources. So now as we move to um, how we're distributing this globally for um, a larger requirement, something like Azure Cosmos DB is available. Uh, you've got native APIs for things like Cassandra, MongoDB, Gremlin, where you can move your database systems up into Azure in a, um, a very straightforward way. You can do those migrations. We have the API that can uh, give you that, you know, quote unquote, one for one um, as you want to do those migrations. And you can see that there are uh, multiple platforms by which you can do it, you know, so you, you, you've got uh, you know, document DBs and graph DBs and, and standard SQL DBs and a lot of capability there. but. The big thing is really what we're looking at is if you're looking for a uh, low latency uh, application that is going to be distributed worldwide and you want to have the same experience for all of your users around the globe, uh, Cosmos DB is a unique and, um, you know, it, it really, it's an offering that really sets itself apart. And so when we talk about having a multimodal database service, you know, we can have all of these different types of databases living in the same service. Uh, and when we get into more of the details about what sets it apart, you look at what the, um, the, the cloud managed database options we have, uh, again, you're, you're not managing anything in the background. You've got this enterprise performance and scale where you can scale up and down as required. Uh, you've got a, a competitive TCO. So when you look at things like licensing on-prem and things like that, you know, by comparison, you're going to save a significant amount of money. And it's developer friendly, right? So we, we, we kept um, a lot of the applications um, so that they work in their, their native languages or um, there are APIs to be able to uh, communicate with the services as they are deployed. Um, and and the, the big thing is really that SLA and what the guarantees are, right? So less than 10 milliseconds in the 99th percentile around the globe, right? And so um, obviously there are strategies on, on ways to um, uh, deploy your, your various database systems, uh, you know, and you've got 
the high availability with with five nines. You've got the throughput guaranteed and the consistency guaranteed um, across all the Azure regions. And um, you know, it, it's the only database that offers those consistency models that we have. And, and really, um, you still have that underlying enterprise grade security that's um, making sure that our data is staying safe. And uh, like I said, there's there's a lot of opportunities for APIs for moving over to the systems. There's just a, a list of, of the ones that are currently available. Uh, and then, you know, those migrations are made easy when you're uh, connecting up into the Cosmos DB using the APIs that are already existing. And finally, when we start looking at uh, building our TCO uh, and what our ROI is going to be um, by saving those licensing costs, by saving those hardware costs, by saving those, uh, you know, networking and, and admin staff and all that, um, you can get significant savings when you when you do a side by side comparison. And when you do when you do these comparisons, you have to keep in mind that there are all those other costs on the left hand side. You know, the licensing, electricity, and networking. And you know, you you, you can't just look at uh, what what the server itself is going to cost, right? There there are significantly other um, costs that are that are involved there, and, and they need to do a true apples for apples. And you can see up to a six x savings. You know, it's pretty significant when you start looking at what those uh, savings can be. And just a case study, right? Where um, you know Bentley was using uh, Mongo, and they. Um, wanted to move it to a, a, a cloud application, and they basically want to um, help their customers uh, with uh, being able to offer a highly service all the customers around the world, and then have that single persistent storage, and so they moved their number of database to Cardinals, and basically they were they allowed their teams that were the systems to get a step back and let their other team maintain the systems for them, and then essentially they opened up their options for them to be able to get to different sources and essentially be able to create ones between the various schemes and is that any better uh you're very quiet but yes i wonder if there we go I wonder if we're having some uh, internet slowness or something. Okay. Yep. It sounds good now. Okay. Hopefully people are done downloading. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and so in, in here, you've got some live links. Uh, so if you want to do some comparison after the fact, you know, like I said, I'll get you the slides. Um, but some some real just very, very high level options and in, in what they're great for. Um, and then you can kind of do some digging on your own um, from both a, a, a relational database system and a, and a non-relational database system. Right. And so I'll just leave that so you guys can go through those later and kind of dig into those each of those services on their own. <laughs> Um, and then some migrations uh, resources, right? So uh, if you want to go check out the database migration system, um, you know, the uh, migration service, you know, uh, the guide is is what's going to give you uh, a step-by-step -step breakdown. You know, I want to I want to migrate from Oracle uh, into Azure. Here, here are the steps you can follow. Here are some options around it. You know, here, here are some questions we're going to ask to try to understand what the workload looks like and give you some help with it. So uh, it'll also hook you up with with partners that can help with the migrations and uh, you know ask questions of, of people such as myself to, to get answers on what that migration would look like. And so that last bucket is is how do we move into the cloud scale analytics, right? And this is you know where uh, we see a lot of use cases built, right? Is is we've got a ton of data that we want to bring up and we want to build that you know a data lake or the data warehouse or um, you run a big data project or advanced analytics and those kinds of things. And and so typically you know we walk through these stages. We take our data, we ingest it, we store it. We do some prep, some transformation, some you know 
just work on the data. Uh, then we're going to serve it up and we're going to visualize it, right? And so um, just some examples of those, you know, Data Factory uh, can do your orchestration uh, as well as some of the transformation now. You know, uh, Data Lake Storage is, is a great landing zone uh, for your raw data sources as they uh, come out of your source systems. Um, and then, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in, in landing all your data and then using it when you need it later, right? Uh, and then it's it's less friction to get the data from the source systems down the road if you're already putting, like, pulling it up. And data lake storage is very uh, inexpensive. And so it's, it's a very good option to use. Uh, Databricks is just one of the options you can use for the data preparation itself for the transformations and things. Uh, you've got Databricks, you've got HD Insight, you've got uh, Data Factory, you've got traditional stored procedures, you've got uh, functions, you know, so a lot of options there. And again, processing the data itself, you know, can be done some with Databricks and we don't SQL Data Warehouse. Uh, you've got options like Snowflake out there, uh, you know, so a lot of good capability there around serving up the data and uh, ultimately reporting on it. So you can go directly from Azure SQL Data Warehouse or, or Databricks or Snowflake up into Power BI, or you can, you know, land that back into a SQL DB. Uh, and, you know, again, it depends on what, what your workload looks like, right? So. Um, a lot of a lot of capabilities in all these services. Um, that just kind of a snapshot, right? So over seventy five data sources you can move to and from with with, uh, with Data Factory, uh, Azure Data Lake Store Gen two brought um, down some uh, great new capabilities with POSIX compliance, finding ACLs. Uh, you know, Data works. We talked about its flexibility and capability there. Uh, so whether it be just a collaboration environment between uh, data engineers and data analysts and data scientists, um, or you know, massive um, uh, scale uh, processing engine. You know, a lot of capability there. SQL Data Warehouse is for, for those really, really large workloads where you need to uh, crank through a bunch of data in a short amount of time. Uh, you know, you, things like DNA mapping and, and um, the items to that scale are, are great for MPP workloads. And then um, obviously our award-winning Power BI, you know, Gartner's top right quadrant um, analytics and, and reporting tool, uh, you know, is no comparison uh, to a lot of the tools that are out there today and at a great price. So looking at some of the um, the design patterns, if you will, or reference architectures, you know, depending on what terminology you want to use. Um, but, you know, this would be your traditional data warehouse pattern, right? So where you're pulling data in, uh, you can do some of your initial ingestion with something like an Azure data box or or using uh, a GUI based tool, a command line based tool, you know, you've got a lot of capability around that. Um, but how do you pull the data in, data in um, you know, doing any of that ingestion, storing it where you're going to store it and use it, um, operationalize it using something like a Cosmos or a SQL DB, uh, doing your data processing, uh, Databricks, Data Factory, HDI, uh, and then essentially setting it out to the serving layer. And a lot of options there, Azure Analysis Services, SQL DB, uh, SQL DW, and then you could also use SQL DB here and, and even a data lake, right? Because you can consume those from Power BI. Um, more of your advanced analytics patterns in Azure, Azure is, you know, um, how are you, um, what are you doing with the data? Or do you, do you have data science workloads? Are you going to get into AI? Uh, you know, so we've got a whole suite of tools for, for training those models, whether they be, uh, you know, Azure ML or ML Studio, uh, which is sort of the, the more on the end of the low code, no code, uh, all the way toward you know things like uh, Databricks or uh, SQL DB uh, with the the ML built in. Um, we have specific data science VMs that allow you to use some of the most popular tools out there, TensorFlows and and those types of tools that are allowing you to to go in and do some um, significant model building and then uh, training and then essentially uh, setting up so that it can then connect to uh, the, the the serving layer uh, for looking at um, what those patterns are and then being able to identify the anomalies in those patterns. And then when we look at what uh, a big data streaming pattern looks like, right, we're, you know, from a, a pure streaming standpoint, 
Uh, so you you want to ingest things like IoT, um, you know, devices. You know, uh, you're an electric company and you have uh, smart meters that you want to uh, pull that data in, or you know, you're a connected car company and you and you want to connect all of the diagnostics off of the car. Uh, so you know, you, you're going to use something like an Event Hubs or IoT Hub or Kafka on HDI that are going to pull that data in. You're going to store it for long term, so you have that raw source um, as you need it. Uh, you can. Uh, then pass that into a Databricks or a, a Stream Analytics um, to do one of two things. You can present directly from those tools into, you know, say like a Power BI or something, or you can uh, do some machine learning against it uh, to look for anomalies in your data and then be able to send alerts back out through like a real-time dashboard or something like that. So a lot of capability around the tools and, and how they get deployed. Um, and then we have what, what's known as the Lambda architecture, which is kind of a combination of that traditional data warehouse, but then also, uh, you know, with with some of the uh, streaming ingestion as well. And so I'm do, doing some comparison against uh, maybe a stream um, and also a batch load and, and working with those. <laughs> So now, as we move from those four main workloads, right, being that modernization on prem, modernization to Azure, uh, distributing our data globally, and, and looking at cloud scale analytics, we want to start looking at okay, now we are making ourselves more productive. We have that hybrid offering that's going to allow customers to, uh, you know, crawl, walk, and then run uh, as they start to adapt more of the technology and, and move their workloads to the cloud, but also still having that uh, that baseline connectivity and, and uh, performance with their backend systems, um, you know, in that, that seamless um, uh, interaction between the two. Uh, to moving to more of the intelligent insights and, and some of the capabilities built into the database systems that we talked about, you know, so creating indexes and, and, and query tuning, um, dynamic data discovery and classification, uh, and then ultimately on the on the most trusted cloud available, right, with with over ninety certifications uh, and uh, you know encrypted at all times. Um, you know, some, some of the great greatest security out there, um, spending over a billion dollars a year with over 3,500 uh, data security professionals or security professionals employed, uh, you know, we've got a, a lot of great capability and, and we, we want to prove to you why we are the world's most trusted cloud. So looking at that productivity, right, let's let's help you to focus on the data and create new insights as opposed to worrying about managing what's happening in the background, right? Let's let's help you to scale quickly uh, and be able to support the innovation that your company wants to take on and, and really still be able to match that with what you currently have, right? So if, if you're good at SQL, let's let's migrate to SQL. If you're, you know, in looking at what those technologies are, uh, let, let's line those up and, and make sure that we're getting you on the systems that you're comfortable with. And then from that hybrid story, you know, we talked about this, right? Being able to extend that infrastructure from your on-premises environment up to the cloud, uh, save a, a bunch of money um, on, because you've already spent on the licensing uh, and, you know, prepay for the compute that you know you're going to use. Uh, again, it's significant savings over the competition with these options and, and lots of capability there. Um, with the intelligence piece, right, is 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 having those predictive capabilities and enabling uh, any new data scenario scenarios. So um, building the systems, having the data clean and trusted to be able to then use it in a different way is is critically important, right? And so you know we're bringing uh, the only commercial database with AI built in to the party to be able to uh, accommodate and facilitate those types of requirements. And then uh, again, trusted, you know, certifications, uh, the our, our smartest minds working on getting you the best technology and making it available and becoming your platform of choice to be able to use the systems that you want of choice. 
Um, plus, you know, the, our great partner network that you guys can work with, like Pragmatic Works, who will help you deploy their, your big data scenario or your your advanced analytics scenario, and and help you move those in in a much faster fashion than having to ramp up and uh, work on it all yourself. And really. Um, I gave a lot of high level scenarios here, right? I, I, I didn't want to focus on any one uh, particular scenario because there are so many different ways of looking at these kinds of things, right? And so ultimately what we want to keep in mind is that uh, there are, you know, significant amount of ways to do this and deploy these. There's really no right or wrong solution. Uh, it's just what's going to work the best for your business. And a lot of times it's driven by policy and what's required from a security standpoint. Or, or regulatory standpoint, right? Um, you know, we can help with uh, giving you a reference architecture and, um, you know, at least giving you a baseline of what you should be looking at based on other customer scenarios that we've seen. Um, but until we have an opportunity to go through your scenario, it, it's hard to say specifically what, what the best way to do it is, right? Um, you know, use things like customer voice if you're not familiar with it uh, most of the azure services power bi office a lot of the services nowadays have a user voice uh, that you're able to ask for new features or track new features that are coming uh, those, those types of requests are heard right and so anybody who's ever used those services knows that you if you request a feature in power bi uh, and a lot of people want that same feature they'll vote for it and the team will start working on it and they'll let you know when they're working on it and when they expect it to come out in, um, you know, some kind of beta form and then, you know, go out to, to full production, right? Um, you know, one of the things that I like to highlight a lot with customers is, you know, Databricks is great, you know, it, it offers a lot of solutions, a lot of capability. Um, but if you don't have uh, programmers who are, you know, very comfortable with with Python or Scala or, you know, some of the languages that are accepted there, maybe it's not the right solution. Maybe you're better off starting with a low code, no code solution uh, to at least start working in the right direction. And as the team gets ramped up on some of the uh, newer technologies and, and some of the skills that you need, you know, maybe those are some of the options then. So you have to really consider what the price and the performance is, you know, so something may be less expensive, but if it's a lot more work to get it up and running because somebody is uh, not proficient in it, you know, is it worth that time, right? Because you're also going to uh, have slowdowns as you ramp up. Um, and, and ultimately, you know, everything, everything has a story, right? And so I like this, everything is fluid. You know, what is the leading solution today become non-optimal tomorrow based on, you know, what's happening, right? We, we release new Azure services every single week, uh, you know, and, and we try to communicate them between Azure blog and a lot of different, uh, outlets like that, where we're, we're putting out just tons of information, um, about what's what's changing in the Azure platform and, and you know with our applications and so you know if if you decide on a solution today and six months from now there's a better solution out there uh, you know it does become a question of you know what's what's more optimal is it is it worth doing those migrations and refactoring is it is it worth uh, the cost of changing or does the solution that you need that, that you really need to uh, come up with it, do you do you have what you need already accomplished and you can stay where you are because it's still fulfilling what you need and everything else is nice to have right so those are all of the considerations that we have to make and that pretty much wraps up my thing i've got a few minutes for questions so um well, there's my contact info i'll leave that up for now but liz you got anything burning for me yeah. Um, okay this is a long one so bear with me um so i presume there has been advancements in cosmos DB, but when I tried it first, when it first came out, document DB and getting data in was not an issue. It was performing performance, getting it out. The issue we have found in Azure is we need to compute the price. We need to compute the price really jumps up much higher than hosting. So we removed Cosmos DB and went to storing in Azure SQL DB and the Power BI reporting has worked much better in the last two years. So what has changed seems drivers from Mongo are still not available. Yeah, I, um, I I think the gist of the question really, I mean, in, in over a two year span, um, Cosmos and Power BI have changed significantly. Um, you know, so 
uh, if, if you were having performance issues with Cosmos back two years ago, uh, it, you know, there is uh, an on-prem emulator uh, that you can use to, to do some of the upfront programmability. That doesn't cost you anything if you just search for Cosmos DB emulator. Um, you know, then you can do some of your development on-prem uh, and save some of those costs there. Um, but my guess is that, you know, whatever issue you were having previously, you know, has been cut down significantly in that amount of time. Okay. Uh, can we use Azure Databricks, Delta Lake slash databases to store model data? Your opinion on Databricks, Delta Lakes uh, slash database versus SQL Data Warehouse? Yeah, it, it, that's that kind of goes back to my point about really it depends on on um, I, you know I think that the Delta Lake is is a great solution. I know that it's being touted as as sort of that next gen data warehouse from Databricks and their team. Uh, it it really comes down to the comfort level of the team. You know, do do you um, do you want to store it in in that system where you're going to be primarily code based to be able to support. Uh, any of the any of the changes, any of the um, uh, basically all of the programming and stuff, or you know, is, is your team more comfortable with the GUI based approach of of more of the you know configuration aspects of, around a SQL DB or a SQL DW uh, you know type architecture using Azure Data Factory? So really, it comes down to a level of comfort. Um, I think it's it's a fine solution. I don't really see any issues with it, other than it's kind of new. Um, so I know that there are certain nuances where uh, not all the tools available that that one would like, especially with uh, its interaction with ADLS Gen two. Um, you know, but again, it's it's an evaluation of of what you really want to accomplish with those systems. Um, all right. Um, as we implement these Azure Data Solutions, is there any specific resource you would recommend we use? We use say with Azure support to make sure one we have what we have is set up correctly and what we're building will fulfill our needs now and in the future as well as advice on cost efficiencies and what we'll implement um, yeah so it can be a little tough with with the cost efficiency um, you know you, you can use the Azure pricing calculator to understand what um, <clears throat> approximately what your costs are going to be. You have to apply what, you know, what the throughput would be, how much data there is, um, you know, that that's going to help. But ultimately, it's a matter of uh, getting your systems deployed, understanding what the compute is that you're going to need, and then doing some optimization based on that. Um, you know, maybe you deploy in a higher tier, you don't need to, um, you know, and again, it depends specifically on the systems, right? If you're, if you're deploying virtual machines, um, you know, using like a Mover type tool, which, which Microsoft acquired not too long ago uh, to do that assessment, you know, might be a good way to evaluate, you know, how much compute you're going to need, um, what kind of platform and service offer offerings that are available compared to leaving it into a VM, uh, you know, and, and those types of things, but then also, um, checking out the the data migration assistant uh, to be able to do an analysis on what you need to move and what some of the nuances are around that would be really helpful as well. Okay, uh, what is the best way of transferring on-premise data in a MySQL database to an Azure MySQL database? The data migration assistant. So the Azure data migration assistant. Um, uh, you know what? You caught me on that one. I don't know if we have full support for it. I know it's coming if it's not in GA yet. Um, but if you want, send me an email. I can get you a status on it. Uh, we have a 27 terabyte uh, SQL Server database. What is the best way to move that in Azure SQL Server? Um, there's a couple different ways you can approach it. Um, you know, it's going to take a while to move it over the wire. Um, you could certainly do a backup uh, and then move it into um, uh, using da DataBox to bring it up into the um, your Azure storage. And then depending on what you're going to do with it, um, you know, 27 terabytes when Hyperscale comes out for managed instance in the last quarter of this year, um, that's probably going to be your best bet. Uh, because you're you're going to have the ability to get up to 100 terabytes when when managed instance 
um, is available for uh, that. And then you can do a restore directly from your um, uh, from your blob storage or, or you know your data lake storage right into managed instance. Uh, so that's that's one good option. Uh, and then the other, you know, would be to look at using um, the the data migration assistant um, to see, you know, what kind of capability it's going to offer you there. Uh, I guess the last one would be to move that whole VM up uh, up into Azure as an IaaS VM and then uh, convert it over that way too. So a couple different options there. All right, great. Well, that was uh, the last question, and so we're right at 12. So, Chris, thank you so much for your presentation. Sorry we had some sound issues. Uh, we will check the recording on that and see what can be done. Yeah. Uh, we are on a break for the next hour. Um, so thank you, guys, and we'll see you on the next session. Thanks again, Chris. Take care, guys.